Hello everyone. Welcome to today's session on the course The History of English Language and Literature. In today's session we continue to take a look at uh, Elizabethan England and also try to position the Elizabethan times in the historical sense. So we'll be taking a look at the period and uh, as a way of quick recap let's recall that this was the time period in which Queen Elizabeth I was reigning from 1558 to 1603. We also saw how the Tudor dynasty came into being and how Elizabeth I came into power uh, through uh, the various marriages of Henry VIII and through the process of reformation. We also noticed that there are various ways in which this age was getting referred to. It was known as the Elizabethan era after the reigning queen. It was also the golden age because of the ways in which the period began to flourish in terms of uh, literature, language, trade, commerce and almost everything. And this was also the English Renaissance. In fact, what had been uh, happening in Italy found replication in uh, the uh, British world only from the reign of Queen Elizabeth onwards. So this period is also known as the English Renaissance. This is also the age of Shakespeare following the name of the most important literary figure of the period and this was also the time when the British Empire inaugurated all its colonial journey so it's also the beginning of the British Empire and uh, we need to give a general background to this period uh, in fact uh, Henry Hudson points out that every breeze was dusty with the pollen of Greece Rome and Italy this is how the general uh, uh, general ambience of the British world was during the Elizabethan period. The implications of Renaissance, Reformation and of the uh, invention of the printing press had begun to take a, a very positive uh, impact in, uh, in British life during the period. And we have seen in many number of ways how Renaissance and Reformation had begun to impact the socio-political and religious life of uh, uh, Britain in general and in addition to this and because of the ways in which uh, a, a very conducive atmosphere was getting uh, forged we also find that there is a discovery of new worlds during the spirit and we find explorers and adventurers uh, getting a lot of excitement through these new voyages that they begin to undertake to the world's unknown in fact Christopher's Col Christopher Columbus discovery of America was uh, could be termed as a turning point in this uh, new uh, voyage towards newer worlds and uh, this also leads to an expansion of trade the accumula accumulation of wealth and we find this point of time that not just a geographical expansion is bound to happen we also find an intellectual revival and an intellectual expansion at this point of time and there is a general prosperity and internal peace that we witnessed during the elizabethan times and this is not just because of the political uh, the stability of the period it's also due to the various additional factors which we would see uh, in a short while and uh, uh, if you remember during the reformation time there was a hostility between the uh, catholics and the protestants we find this uh, considerably diminishing during the elizabethan times and we do uh, notice that the Elizabethan court is more secular in nature and compared to all the other reigning monarchs of uh, England she is the first one to uh, begin to practice a kind of religious uh, uh, moderation within Britain and her attitude in general is considered more tolerant but as an aside it's important for us to also remember that she uh, during her reign also uh, due to her the, uh, the the advice of her council and uh, uh, due to a lot of political needs she is also seen to be persecuting some of the Catholics in uh, uh, maybe not in so uh, very blatant ways as the Mary the first did to the Protestants but we do find that the Protestants enjoy a lot of good favor during Elizabeth's reign compared to that of the Catholics many of the Catholics lose their positions it's very difficult to uh, it was then very difficult to hold office if you belong to the Catholic faith so there is an active encouragement to pro pursue Protestant faith but in general the court promoted a lot of uh, uh, religious moderation and a sense of secular spirit and we also find that England uh, as uh, against Europe it had become a safe haven for the Protestants we find a lot of people belonging to the Protestant faith migrating to London hoping for a better life and for a better safe future and at this time we also realized that the wealth of the clergy had begun to considerably de decrease the clergy loses almost all the positions that they uh, held in Britain and uh, church also loses Catholic Church primarily loses most of the land which they had occupied in Britain and their general uh, economic conditions begin to plummet during this time 
and uh, overall we find that there's a sense of peace there's a sense of prosperity there's more political stability this also led to a cosmopolitan way of thinking uh, among the people and we find that there is a they they all dare to question thanks to reformation there's also a sense of self uh, awareness thanks to thanks to the many ideals of uh, renaissance which was uh, getting flourished during this period and it's uh, important to notice the kind of transition which was happening we begin to see that in the earlier period when uh, during the middle ages and even in the early tudor period the entire socio political world of britain was getting framed within the uh, within the ideals of roman uh, catholicism and of medieval theology so whether it's church or the ideas of faith order truth god the ideas of sacred the notions of uh, society morality and all of these were getting framed within how the church was envisioning all of these ideals to be and soon after reformation and through the course of renaissance we find that there is a transition towards a, a different mode of thinking the uh, the the, uh, the value system entirely undergoes a change the socio political and economic awareness undergoes a change even the ways in which the common people are getting positioned their value systems etc all of that undergoes a drastic change during this period and this period incidentally becomes the inaugural period of uh, elizabethan uh, age also so we find that there is an increased sense of uh, reason there's a uh, primary importance accorded to rationality and uh, to culture as against nature and also a lot of scientific discoveries and expeditions uh, take place during this period and skepticism in fact which was looked down upon in the earlier times in medieval theology to be a skeptic or to raise any skeptical point was equivalent to uh, blasphemy one could even run the risk of uh, getting executed but in the elizabethan period we realize that skepticism had become something of a, a fashionable trait in fact many of the intellectuals many of the educated class they had begun to display traits of skepticism uh, for being a bit fashionable intellectually fashionable during the time it was quite a trendy thing then and uh, we also find a lot of travel happening in the elizabethan period we also see that the court also had funded a lot of sea uh, adventures in order to discover new worlds to establish newer kinds of trades so on and so forth and we do see that there is a more secular understanding of art literature religion morality culture everything in fact and whatever secularism was getting practiced within the court within elizabethan court it gets translated into the streets as well there's a way in which people are freer to express and this kind of freedom in expression we find it getting directly translated into the literature of the times we later when we begin to look at the drama of the elizabethan times we'll see that the elizabethans had dared to question and move away from the classic forms of literature and to practice their own kinds of uh, uh the performances their own kinds of uh, poetry so on and so forth so this transition was very significant not just in the political and social uh, re uh, or religi religious life of england but it had begun to frame the ways in which english literature was being understood as well at this point let's take a closer look at how the society of the elizabethan times was getting framed this is a useful acronym which could be used to understand the various factors which would uh, frame our uh, nation's uh, uh, events uh, politics economics religion society intellectual influences and artistic trends this acronym persia is useful for us to recollect and remember how various events are getting framed in fact we've already taken a look at the politics of elizabethan period and uh, we saw how various dynasties were getting changed and we saw uh, the wars we saw the important events like reformation shaping the uh, country politically and uh, we've seen a little bit of how the economics of the nation was getting uh, framed we will also see in the in some of the later sessions how our, our nationalist uh, our economy was getting uh, uh, to emerge during that period we've seen the various effects of religion and how that had influenced the dynastical changes and also the uh, emergent trends in the society In today's session we'll be primarily looking at how the society of the Elizabethan times was getting framed and in the later sessions when we uh, take a look uh, a detailed look at the literature and art of the time we'll also see the intellectual influences and the artistic trends in a, a greater detail so uh, coming back to how the society was getting uh, formed during the time it's important for us to understand 
how England was during the Elizabethan times. It was a very different time altogether. England was undergoing a, a period of transition. So it's useful to recollect that though this is seen as a golden age and though a lot of peers, internal prosperity, political stability, etc., were the dominant features of the times, we have to notice that this was not a, an easy life for the Elizabethans during that period. During this transition politically and uh, uh, religiously, they also had to encounter a lot of other uh, problems which uh, especially the common people were facing. Uh, life in Elizabethan times were not so promising in terms of life expectancy. In fact, the life expectancy was barely uh, 40 years during that time. And it's said that historians, uh, from a lot of records they have unearthed, it is generally assumed that 5% of the children died within a week, 40% were just lucky if they made it to their 15th birthday, and one in every 100 uh, women, they, lo uh, they lost their lives after childbirth. So, uh, the general health conditions were not so promising, especially among the common people. So, there were a lot of challenge to even to keep themselves alive during this period. And the other feature was that of uh, patriarchy. Incidentally, though England was uh, ruled by a monarch who is a female, England for the first time had a queen and Queen Elizabeth I. In spite of that, the patriarchal conditions of the society did not change much. This is a very ironical fact that historians uh, do note because within the court there is a predominance of a female uh, power that we find, but outside the court things remain pretty much the same for women. And this was uh, 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 the, the implication of this and the reflections of this was found primarily in two things, in education and also in the laws of inheritance. Uh, girls hardly got any kind of education. Formal education was restricted to boys alone and uh, 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 the very few wealthy, uh, lucky boys and men got to go to the university for a formal education and the women were mostly required to stay at home and they were getting trained to become wives or mothers. So this was the kind of education that the women during the time received and their lives were uh, not very better within the household either because the head of the house was always the husband or the father. So the women were generally considered as property of their husbands or, or of their uh, fathers. So there was no amount of power which was getting uh, transferred from the courtly power to any of these women during that period. They continued to live a life which was perhaps slightly better than that of the medieval times. And some of the wealthy girls and young women enjoyed a bit of an education because they were getting trained in languages such as uh, Latin and uh, French and also some kind of exposure into the dominant kinds of art and literature of the period. And Queen Elizabeth I, she is uh, said to have received a very good education at a young age and which had reflected in the ways in which she was promoting all of these arts as well. So uh, the other thing was that of inheritance. The rule of primogeniture was quite uh, prevalent in Britain during this time, which meant that all the property and, uh, and or any kind of uh, estate, uh, wealth, uh, uh, any kind of position, all of that uh, were inherited by the oldest male of the family. The female had no power of inheritance. We find the same rule getting applied even within the court. In fact, if you remember, King uh, Henry VIII, uh, at the time of his death, he had three surviving children. First one was Mary the first, second one was Elizabeth the first, and third one was Edward the sixth. But we find that the crown directly goes to the young teenage Edward the sixth, overlooking both the older sisters. And only after that, uh, first Elizabeth the first. First Mary the first and later Elizabeth the first gets to assume the crown. So the rule of primogeniture was pretty strong during that period that it found its way even within the court. And we do find that uh, the common people's lives were fairly dominated by this rule so that uh, marriages, relationships, everything was uh, getting dictated around how the estate and other kinds of property would get inherited and uh, uh, who the oldest male was so on and so forth and not having a male heir as an inheritance could deal to a lot of catastrophe as far as a family is concerned. We do know that England even changed its future, its religion, its political nature, all of that because Henry VIII was desperately searching for a male heir. So this was the kind of uh, power that this rule of primogeniture had on Elizabethan England. And finally, we also see that there's a lot of migration happening from the rural hinterlands of uh, England to 
uh, the city of London because London was increasingly becoming the center of power, the center of commerce, the center of courtly life, center of art, center of drama and everything that was happening uh, to the country was getting uh, implicated within the uh, life of the city of London. And uh, at this point, it's useful to remember that England uh, could be divided into two parts. The south and the east part of England was wealthier than the north and the western part. And because of that, there was a greater social divide between the classes in the north and the western parts. And we also find that many of the good changes, the positive changes of the way the socio-political things happening to Britain was slow to arrive to uh, the, the northern and the western part. It was mostly all kinds of development, all kinds of prosperity, all kinds of uh, uh, finer things happening in terms of art, literature, drama, etc. They were happening in the, southern, in the southern and eastern parts of England and everything was focused primarily in London. At this point, it's important for us to take a look at uh, how Elizabethan uh, London during the Elizabethan uh, period was getting fashioned. As we have noted, there's a mass migration from the rural parts towards the city of London. And this had made London, in fact, the breeding ground of all kinds of diseases. There was poor hygiene which prevailed in London. The sanitation was very poor. In fact, there was River Thames uh, uh, along the city of, by the city of London, which actually had acted as a natural cleanser. In spite of that, the poor sanitation had a lot of uh, uh, implications in the life of the commoners in London. There was no drainage system in place during the Elizabethan times. It had led to a lot of uh, uh, infestation of uh, rats, uh, diseases, etc. city was generally crowded because it was overpopulated due to this mass migration from uh, the other parts of the country. It was filthy, which was quite obvious. And it was a breeding ground for all kinds of diseases. The most important one being Black Death, also known as the bubonic plague. The plague had affected uh, London even earlier. In fact, uh, all of Europe was swept under the plague even in the 14th century. And th that was a plague which lasted for almost a year, we had noted in one of the previous sessions. But uh, it had struck again in El during the Elizabethan times. We first see the attack of plague in 1563. And this was after the Queen Elizabeth had assumed her throne. And the impact of plague which was such that we find Queen Elizabeth shifting her uh, residence from London to Windsor Castle during this time. She had even avoided all kinds of visits and visitors from London in 1563. There was a prohibition on the uh, import of goods to prevent the spread of plague. And it is said that she even executed all the visitors from London to Windsor Castle in order to keep her court safe from any kind of infection. Because once you were struck with the plague, death was quite certain. And the death toll was also quite enormous. It said that in a month, about uh, in a week, about 1,000 to 1,800 deaths were getting reported. And that's really a huge number. And we also saw in one of the earlier sessions how this huge wipeout of the population had an impact on the way labor was getting uh, fixed and in the ways in which the social classes were getting regulated as well. So the plague struck again and again in 1593, in 1603, and once after the death of Queen Elizabeth in 1608. So we find that this had drastically changed the ways in which Londoners were living and also the life was not considered as very promising because of the disease, because of, because of the impending death, so on and so forth. But the important and the most positive thing for us to remember is that in spite of all these challenges, England continues to go forward in terms of its artistic pursuit, in terms of its uh, uh, commercial pursuit, its political stability, so on and so forth. And that's what makes this golden age particularly important important for us because this was not an age which was devoid of problems but this was an age where the English people were learning to overcome the problems and that took quite successfully. And at this point it's important to see what the different social classes of uh, uh, Britain uh, were like. So this is important for us to understand how the mobility of uh, across social classes was getting formed. And uh, this takes us to see how the social classes were getting forged during the time. In the social pyramid, if you could call that, we had the monarch at the top, followed by the nobility, the gentry, merchants, yeomen, 
laborers altogether there were six social classes in uh, britain during this time during the elizabethan time things have changed drastically from then on with uh, an increasing sense of social mobility which we would see how and why and uh, at the top uh, with at the, as the monarch obviously we had the king or the queen and the nobility include included dukes earls and barons there were two ways in which one could attire uh, when one could attain uh, the noble status one was through birth and the other one was through court appointments thirdly the gentry comprised of the knights gentlemen squires they were also the ones who got to uh, sit as the as the members of the parliament then there were merchants who include who were uh, people who had begun to amass a lot of wealth through the new kinds of trades which were emerging they were also the ones who were getting appointed as the mayors of various cities and the mayor of the city of london in fact is said to have uh, exercised a lot of power and at times even over the uh, power of the queen in certain extent uh, in the sense that there is a historical document which shows how during one of the outbreaks of the plague the mayor of london wanted to prohibit all kinds of performances in order to uh, reduce the risk of infection but the queen wanted the show to go on and to have all the uh, playhouses open but at this point we find that the mayor uh, surpasses the queen's orders and uh, orders the uh, playhouses to be shut during that time so there was a, a way in which the merchant class had begun to enjoy some kind of uh, power Uh, at par with the uh, noble classes and they also begin to rise to power with the um, accumulation of wealth so at this point we find that apart from birth and uh, the court appointments there is also wealth which becomes a determinant of how one could climb up the social ladder and they were the common citizens uh, known as the yeomen and the laborers uh, who were mostly landless they were carpenters they were peasants in fact they led a fairly uh, unhealthy life during that time their economic conditions were very poor in fact one of the first welfare schemes that queen elizabeth began to enact it was for the welfare of the laborers so uh, these were the six social classes and uh, one significant thing is that if one belonged to one of those top classes of the uh, nobility or the gentry there was this hostility between the uh, protestants and the catholics and we find that most of the court appointments to any of the positions of importance it always used to be from the uh, protestant uh, faith and uh, in fact only the old noble families belonged to the catholic faith and they were not given uh, much importance in the social and political order of the day and uh, the queen elizabeth had a lot of reservations about making new court appointments so at this time uh, period in britain we find that there were only about 55 noble families so new court appointments were not uh, being made and the queen did not encourage any new members getting admitted into this royal fold either so social mobility was something which uh, distinguishes the social order of uh, uh, elizabethan england at a later at an earlier point during the medieval times it was difficult for anyone to go up or down the ladder because this was more or less the social classes were more or less a rigid fixed structure but from the elizabethan time onwards thanks to the ideals of renaissance reformation the increasing uh, intellectual awareness self awareness so on and so forth Uh, social mobility was um, uh, 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 more like a reality one of the ways in which one could move up and down the social ladder was through marriage so those were mostly marriages of convenience it was either to any of the family could rise up in the uh, in in the social class through a prospective marriage to a wealthy person or by marrying into a noble family and through court appointments as we have seen and education and wealth were two new indicators of uh the social class social merit so on and so forth it, it is during this time that the notions of uh, merit are getting framed we begin to notice it's important for us to note over here that even our own notions of merit our notions of class etc are heavily mediated by the ways in which the social class of britain was uh, getting framed but this is not to say that everything was quite sound and fine because of social mobility there were also sumptuary laws which were laws for regulation of consumption which indicated that 
only the nobility could buy and uh, enjoy certain kinds of privileges even certain kind of uh, dress code was limited to certain classes not everyone with money could uh, buy and enjoy or consume various kinds of things as and when they pleased so in spite of all these things social mobility was uh, and is continue, continues to be a distinctive factor of uh, elizabethan england and uh, we continue to see how all of these things began to cause uh, social tensions as well as to who would be the ruling class of the times because there was a time in the middle english period when only the monarch could rule and there was no way other than by birth or by conquest one could uh, be part of the ruling class but from the elizabethan time onwards the notions of uh, a hierarchy begin to change and we find that many of them have begun to uh, lay their claim upon what who and how the ruling class gets formed we find that uh, uh, at this point we also find that wealth classical education and liberal uh, arts training becomes uh, indicators of one's uh, um, merit or one's entry into the ruling class and in order to uh, make a smooth transition at this point we find thomas eliot authoring a book named the governor in 1531 which had uh, the notions of a true gentleman how to train uh, statesmen so on and so forth so this the important thing to note is that uh, statesmanship rulership etc are beginning to be seen as virtues into which one is not really born into but things into which one can be trained and also uh it's highlighted during the elizabethan times that a merchant may be rich but if he has no education of manners he is disqualified to rule this also rules out the possibility of anyone with a lot of wealth anyone with a lot of uh, uh resources coming into power only because he has got wealth and no other kinds of virtue and this is the time when we also notice a lot of debate around aristocratic privilege the notions of commonness how social hierarchy can be ordered or reordered so on and so forth and this is the time when the nation begins to consolidate itself like they had begun to do from the middle english period onwards it said about the elizabethan period politically that men lived intensely thought intensely and wrote intensely this had resulted in a united nation with intense patriotism we find a keen interest uh, in england's past a pride in the queen's greatness and a hatred of english enemies and we find an extravagant loyalty being displayed to the queen which was an one uh, hitherto uh, not known thing in england because we find uh, there's no factionalism in elizabethan england during that time and there is an increased sense of loyalty to whatever the monarch does the queen enjoyed a lot of privilege and lot of popularity in that sense compared to many of her uh, uh, successors and her predecessors and we find that she ruled almost without any kind of internal threat though there were a lot of attacks from the uh, catholic uh, uh, faction for a brief period and what really marked the beginning of uh, and the consolidation of uh, uh, queen elizabeth's rule in england was her victory over the spanish armada in 1588 and this is important uh, in the international history as well spanish armada in fact uh, refers to the army of uh, spain and they invaded uh, britain in 1588 in fact philip ii of spain was also the husband of mary the first so there is a prior history to this in the sense that philip ii was ruling over england and spain when he was married to mary the first who, uh, who who dies and then elizabeth the first succeeds when elizabeth the first comes to power philip ii had sent her his ambassadors to uh, elizabeth in order to uh, with a marriage proposal but uh, queen elizabeth had rejected it and we know that she continued to remain the virgin queen and unmarried queen until the end of her life and uh, uh, due to these reasons philip ii uh, did not have a lot of kind emotions towards uh, the queen of uh, uh, england and in uh, addition to this philip ii was an avid catholic and we know that england had become protestant and also was promoting lot of protestantism and will had had become a haven for the protestant believers in the elizabethan times and we find that he had uh, this animosity also in his mind and with the support of the roman catholic church they called it the enterprise of england and uh, we find the spanish armada launching an attack on uh, england in 1588 and uh, in, when we talk about the spanish armada the enormity of that were it's it's very important to note we know that spanish armada was not any ordinary fleet they had 130 ships about 2500 guns 
8,000 seamen and 20,000 soldiers. So it was an enormous fleet that attacked the coast of England on 29th July 1588. So this had, in fact, many of the people during their period thought that the end of this was going to mark the end of the Elizabethan times. But on the contrary, what happened that uh, was uh, uh, quite reverse. The storms were quite unfavorable for the Spanish fleet to reach the English coast. So they were they already had lost a lot of ships. And in addition to that, Sir Francis Drake he launched an attack, a raid on the Spanish ships even before the ships reached the coastline of uh, uh, England. And in addition, Britain had also sent out uh, uh, fire ships to, the, uh, to, uh, to destroy the fleet of uh, the Spanish Armada. This was a new technique to be used in the, uh, in, in, uh, the naval attack as well. So we find that due to these various kinds of things, Spanish Armada loses out and they lose out uh, on their resources. Many of the ships are lost. They are forced to return to Spain empty-handed and almost in a state of uh, uh, collapse. And uh, this had marked the beginning of a new kind of empire, the rise of the British Empire, because until that point, Spain was considered as the empire on which the sun never sets. They were the leading, uh, uh, they were the leading nation in uh, commerce and trade and uh, all kinds of things which uh, mattered to the world at that point of time. And we find gradually Britain replacing uh, Spain and taking over as the land on which the sun never sets. In fact, in 1589, uh, a year after the, the fall of Spanish Armada, we find Britain launching an attack on uh, Spain, an attack back on Spain, but that's a failed attempt. And in 1596 and in 1597, the Spanish Armada tried to attack England over and again twice, but again they have to go back because of the storms and the adverse conditions. So uh, overall, you know, we find many of the things conspired together to make Britain into a global force during this period. And in 1604, there is an end to this all kinds of hostility between, uh, hostility ends between Britain and uh, Spain because a new treaty is uh, signed by Elizabeth, uh, the successor of Elizabeth I and the successor of Philip II. So that marks an end to the ongoing tussle between Spain and uh, Britain. But there were other economic uh, implications of this event in the sense that uh, as soon as the uh, uh, victory over Spanish Armada was proclaimed, a lot of voyagers became interested in, uh, in, in going for far-reaching sea adventures and many of them thought that they could travel as far as the East Indies for trade and for a better life. So we find many of the merchants coming together and ensuing this trade with the uh, this voyage to the far distant lands and uh, they had a group of merchants known as uh, uh, the uh, later known as the East India Company a group of merchants they begin to uh, begin these voyages from Britain to far off lands from 88 onwards from 1588 onwards they finally send a couple of successful ships and the Queen then grants them a charter and this gets formed as the East India Company. This we also know is the starting point of the British Empire and the British colonial period as well. And this uh, instance which took off from the victory over Spanish Armada has a lot of impact on the ways in which the history of the sub subcontinent of India also gets written from the Elizabethan time onwards. So in many different ways the Elizabethan times and the socio-political and the historical background of the period becomes important not just in shaping the life and future of Elizabethan times but also in redefining the ways in which many of the other nations begin to see themselves and their uh, colonial relationship with Britain. With this, we almost come to an end to this session, taking a look at how Britain begins, begins to consolidate itself as with London as the center of commerce, drama and politics. We'll soon see when we get to look at uh, the various kinds of literature and performances that were prevalent in uh, Britain and also uh, Britain uh, co quiet uh, easily becomes the empire on which the sun never sets, replacing all other European competitors and also becoming the world leader in all, all of the things that matter during the time. And there's a growth in population, the language begins to evolve, Britain comes a long way from the Middle Ages, striving towards a better colonial period as well. And this is a time when distinct features of Englishness also begin to emerge. And in the next session, we'll take a detailed look at how 
the uh, stage was getting set for drama and other kinds of fine arts to emerge during this period. With this, we come to the end of this session. Thank you for listening and see you in the next class.